Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On June 25th, 1867, Lucian B. Smith of Ohio received the first patent for barbed wire, something that was modified in later years and would ultimately transform the American West and the landscape of American farming. Although this may not seem like it has anything to do with the Football History Podcast, I argue that there is a definite correlation. For you see, this week's guest talks about a man that was born exactly four months before this patent and the benefits from farming helped him forge an empire and he played a role in what would ultimately become the Chicago Bears. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is February 25th, 1867, on a farm in the middle of North Carolina. We're here for the birth of a man that many might not know the name, but he has a direct link to one of the original teams in the NFL. That is Augustus Eugene Staley. Now, we'll get into the connection here in a little bit, but first, I want to introduce this week's guest. We have Julie Staley, the wife of the great-grandson of A.E. Staley, to share the story of what really could be considered one of the founders of the NFL. Now, Julie is the president of the Staley Museum, which is located in the old A.E. Staley home. Now, this is another one of those stories that's, I guess you could say, a little bit different than the typical Football History Dude episode, but... It is a great story and something to help us understand the thought process of some of the people that had a vision for industry and then ultimately something that at the time was kind of a perfect timing for what would be professional football at the beginning of a golden age of sports. Now, we'll get into the interview here shortly, but first, I want to let you know that you can learn more about the Staley Museum and some of the other links that we mentioned in the episode right through your podcast player. Also, if you enjoy this episode of Sports History, then you should head over to the network website where we have, as of now, 12 different podcasts pumping out sports history content all the time, and we continue to grow. The website is sportshistorynetwork.com. You can head over there right after this interview. But for now, let's get into that interview with Julie Staley. Museum and everything, what's your role there? So um, I'm the president of the board at the museum. So. Uh, I, I was actually one of the ones that um, it was my project to get off the ground. I undertook that project and um, helped get it off the ground and and uh, worked on it myself. Um, there's already there's a whole other story there. We, we already have another family museum in town. It's called the Hieronymus Mueller Museum. There's a company in town called the Mueller Company. And uh, basically, they have thousands of patents on water products products uh, for, for water companies, uh, commercial water companies. And one of them is they made uh, the butterfly b- valve for the fire hydrant. So they invented 
They essentially invented the fire hydrant. So, so a lot of places you go in the country will say, the fire hydrant will say Mueller on it. That's that Mueller. Uh, so that company uh, started Indicator. It's still Indicator, but it has uh, uh, head, uh, headquarters and different locations around the country. Um, and we have a museum there for, uh, the, the, for the company. And that is my husband's grandmother's family. So his grandfather was A.E. Staley Jr. A.E. Staley Jr. married a Mueller. So it was this these two dynasties that kind of came together and created the, this, this, you know, legacy um, uh, at the time. It was in the 1926 when they got married. Uh, so it was the uh, wedding of the century in Decatur. And we actually have a big display at the Staley Museum about it. So going back to answer your question, um, we saw the success of that museum and we knew we had a heck of a lot of memorabilia from uh, the Staley family. And we could partner with them and complement that. So that's what we did is we, uh, we, you know, we kind of, we went to their board, which of course my husband is on that board because he's a member of the family. And we said, Hey, you know, we would like to, we were thinking about starting a Staley museum and, you know, could we, could, could your staff help us kind of, you know, build, you know, build things up, build it from the ground up like you guys did. You did such a great job. It's a beautiful facility. And at the very same time we were doing that, um, someone came to us and, that owned the Staley Mansion, which is the house that A.E. Staley lived in, and said, hey, we're, we renovated the house and we're selling it now. Would you like to look at it? And we were like, okay. So we had no idea about anything at all. We just wanted to take a look at it. We were just curious. We thought, oh, we would like to go in there and see it because we had known that it was in a, a lot of disarray. So we were surprised to find out that it had been renovated. And when we walked in, it was it was just completely redone as much to its uh, original s uh, structure as possible. And we just knew immediately that we had to find a way to keep that house in the family and not let it get uh, outside of the family again and we knew that we had a, a literally a home for our museum so the Staley Museum is in the Staley Mansion and happens to be just a block away from the Hieronymus Mueller Museum uh, so we share staff and uh, but we're two separate entities and have two separate boards uh, and uh, uh, we share a lot of stories not only family stories uh, there were two actually Staley Mueller weddings that uh, happened uh, we have a lot of family stories, but we share the Decatur history um, and a lot of history in just the burgeoning of, uh, of uh, industry at that time uh, in the you know 1800s and the early 1900s, uh, uh, how, how industries were moving and changing and uh, how uh, people were making it happen, you know, starting from, from scratch. So, uh, so a lot of shared history there, and we've really enjoyed uh, this journey. Yeah, I saw through your website that at one back then it was considered the soy bean capital of the world. <laughs> yes, 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 exactly. Yeah, everybody has enjoyed that title. <laughs> yeah, and that's something going through the website too. Of course, I was researching, you know, the the museum and such, and I saw that I, I always wondered what AE stood for. I didn't realize it was Augustus. <laughs> yeah, Augustus Eugene, and they called him Gene, and then his son AE Jr. was called Gus. So that's how they differentiated them. But then there was an a the A.E. the third who uh, is, has passed away. He was also called Gene. So there are two different genes uh, and then a Gus in there. And uh, so, yeah, they had their way of distinguishing them. Did they ever or did your husband or anybody ever tell you how he got the name Augustus, as in basically the first Roman Empire had that same name, too. That's true. Um, we never have heard a story as to why the name Augustus. It was not a name. Uh, we've done a lot of research on uh, the on an with ancestry, and it was not like a family name. There were there weren't other people named Augustus. Um, we have no record of where that would have come from and 
and he never spoke of where his name came from, either his first or his his middle name. Uh, neither one of them were really family names. So uh, it would be, yeah, we would love to be able to answer that because it ended up, you know, it's now into what, if we're in fourth, fourth generation, fifth generation using that name, and we're not really sure exactly how they originally came up with it. Right. It's such a unique name when I was looking it up. And again, I didn't, I never knew what A.E. Staley stood for when we first started the show. Oh, geez. We're talking back in 2018. And of course, you have to start with the beginning of the NFL. So naturally, you go to George Hallis. And then from there, it's, oh, what's this Decatur Staley's all about? So then that's why I wanted to bring you on mostly, but I wanted to get a background as to the man that built the company that then turned into, well, now, that the, the, it really for him was a side business. I understand like, as far as the NFL, he didn't even have anything to do with that necessarily, but he put the groundwork and brought George Hallis in. I mean, what was that thought process or what is he, did he grow up playing sports? This is A.E. Staley. He was a sports fanatic. Uh, he loved sports. Uh, he was a, he was a big, uh, kid. He was, uh, um, uh, very husky is, is a word that I, I've uh, seen reference to him in uh, historical material. A husky kid. Uh, he was um, you know, about six foot two, um, and I think into his his later years, he was he was getting up to like two hundred and seventy five pounds. Uh, he had some health issues, you know, as he got older. Uh, but he was not a small person in any in any way, shape, or form. Uh, uh, and so he loved sports. He loved being active. Of course, you know, back then, you know, he was outside. He was farming. Uh, they were, uh, you know, always doing physical work. And he needed that um, relaxation of sports. Baseball was his thing. Baseball was what he truly loved. And and and, and back in the 1800s, of course, in the late 1800s you know, baseball was, was very popular and, you know, an organized, uh, po very popular sport. Uh, football was, you know, just kind of, you know, people were, were learning about that and, and it was just getting it, you know, it's, it's start, uh, more or less. Um, so, uh, baseball was really his thing, but he really loved all, all sports as it seems to have uh, gone down the, uh, family, uh, tree, uh, as uh, they all do still today. Uh, sports is something that uh, they all enjoy. <laughs> so being that the, the area, does that mean that they're bears fans or is this not really a football family at all? Oh, oh yeah, definitely bears. Yeah. Uh, definitely. And it's, it's, it, although it is not difficult, we, we live in, uh, we're in central Illinois. There really aren't other teams around anyway. Uh, uh, I'm actually from the St. Louis area uh, in Southern Illinois. And, you know, St. Louis is, is not a football town at all. They, they've had football teams, but it's never really stuck there. Uh, they're just not a football town. Uh, so, you know, uh, so, so many people in, in, in Illinois and in, in the Midwest have, have you know taken on on the bears as is their team uh you know it, it obviously has a very long history too and so i know a lot of families have you know also share uh, a legacy of being bears fans uh of course when you go to the pro football hall of fame it's you know on george hallis drive everything there uh you know uh just screams bears and uh uh yeah it's a pretty that's a pretty remarkable place to go if you're a bears fan it's kind of uh, interesting too. Obviously, it's not like a direct correlation, but you being from St. Louis and where the Chicago Cardinals went to before they ended up moving on. And uh, I only one reason why I bring that up. Everybody on my show, I don't know if you can see my Lions logo right here. Oh yeah, I have to get uh, the little. I can only get so many jabs in every year as far as victory. So I got to get that last jab in there for that <laughs> that sack fumble that we had. But you know, the one of the guys that we we have on our network, Joe Ziemba, he has a podcast called When Football Was Football, and he's all about. Actually, I th he may have been the one that put me onto your your uh, museum. Oh gosh, he he's running he's running a. Um, he wrote a book about the Chicago Cardinals, but then now it's more about the Cardinals and the uh, Bears at the beginning. So he may have even gotten some information from your, your company, I'm imagining. But uh, I, I like to just go back and forth with him and everything. But uh, speaking of that, wh why did Gene start sports teams for a manufacturing company? What was the goal there? Well, there, there are uh, several things that were going on. Um, uh, uh, first of all, um, Back then, 
a, a lot of large manufacturing companies had these sports teams. They were industrial leagues and industrial teams. And, um, uh, you know, they would have a, a, usually a baseball team, of, you know, maybe a football. A lot of them had a football team. Um, uh, the Staley Company had really everything eventually. They had, you know, basketball, uh, the women's sports, uh, um, bowling, uh, you know, all, all kinds of, uh, of things. And uh, uh, so it was something that, first of all, was going on around them. They were playing other companies like the Mueller Company had teams and then of course you know you go into the history of you know the, like the packers you, you know that's kind of how th that all got started uh uh with people that were working in in manufacturing companies uh and they were these industrial league teams so ae staley of course wanting to do everything in a very big way wanted to make sure he wasn't you know would not want to be left out wanted to do everything everybody else was doing and and he was a competitive guy he wasn't afraid of, of competition in any way shape or form so he was like bring it on we're gonna we're not only going to play but we're going to be the best at it and they were and whether no matter if it was baseball football whatever he made sure that he gave them all the resources that they had to be the best at what they could 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 be and uh he enjoyed you know watching the wins and and and, and watching you know watching the the, the the fight to the top and uh uh you know winning championships and he was very proud of that there was you know a lot of pride people took a lot of pride in in those companies and being you know, being one of the being part of those companies was like a family back then uh you were with a company usually your whole life and so this was your family this was your world and uh those teams really meant a lot that camaraderie was very very important so uh so so you have th that whole history of um uh, industrial league teams. Uh, I'm sure there are uh, books and documentaries just about that alone because it's really fascinating how how uh, sports history kind of begins with that, uh, especially for football, for a lot of football teams. Um, uh, but but on top of it, uh, A.E. Staley's company, uh, the Staley Manufacturing Company, had what they started what's called the Staley Fellowship Club. And uh, basically it was uh, kind of turned into what's become like the credit union today where they uh, provided, uh, you know, in, in insurance and uh, uh, they, they had, uh, ways that people could get, you know, help with things that they needed. And, um, uh, they had a lot of, uh, social gatherings to dinners, uh, parties, a Christmas party, New Year's party, uh, things like that. And then the athletic teams came out of part of the, the fellowship club. So there was, you know, they had golf or they had bowling and, uh, the baseball team and the football team, they were part of this fellowship club and they had a beautiful clubhouse on the lake and uh it was just um a, a golden age it really was a golden age when all of this was happening it was of course the 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 the, the height was you know in the uh, start of the 20s uh when when the baseball and the football was was really at its height uh, 1920, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, uh, so, you know, things were, were good. Things were, were very good. And again, A.E. Staley loved competition and, uh, these teams were winning. So the people in the company were really enjoying it too. Yeah. You mentioned something at the beginning there, how he, I don't know what you want to take on all commerce, take ch any challenge on. And I saw that quote where he said, and I don't know, was it Decatur paper or something where big men don't do small things. So yes. I guess he didn't do small things when it came. How big was the company at the height of it? You know, actually that's, I, it would have to depend on what year you were looking at. Um, I, I think, uh, it, it's hard to say up to how many, I think there may be 2,000, 3,000 employees when he was there. I think after he left, it was up to maybe 5,000 employees. I can't, I can't say today, of course, uh, what their exact total is, um, but it, you know, into the thousands of, of uh, employees. I, I think maybe, you know, 2,000 2, employees, 3,000 employees maybe at that time. Which for that time would have been, I would imagine, higher than like nowadays we see more bigger companies and right. things like that where there it was like the few in the in between and a lot more specialized companies mm -hmm. but uh speaking of specialization one guy he brought on of course we kind of alluded to that george hallis why did he choose him and what was his role at the beginning there 
Well, anybody that knows uh, Hallis's background knows that he was uh, kind of a trailblazer uh, at U of I, uh, which is just down the road from Decatur. So uh, hop, skip and a jump uh, uh, down the road. So a lot of people, you know, Decatur would go see U of I games. They knew about them. And, and, and it was very uh, tangible, you know, people from University of Illinois. Um, and he was always looking, no matter whether it was his company or his, his sports you know, looking for the best, the best people to do the job. And he had heard about this George Hallis guy. And, um, you know, he, he was at the right situation where Hallis was young and, you know, needed a, a job, a good steady job, uh, and had the skill the athletic skill at that point to be able to uh, uh, go far, it, it seemed. Uh, and he was very versatile because he played on the baseball team, too. He played on the Staley baseball team and the Staley football team. So uh, A.E. Staley got someone who was able to work at the company, work, uh, help him with the football team and help him with the baseball team. So it was uh, uh, it was kind of a win, win, win. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that uh, for George Hallis, that was, uh, you know, a great opportunity right out of college to, you know, get get that uh, get that offer. So, uh, yeah. The other thing is A.E. Staley. I hear this over and over. I hear, read and find out about this from many unrelated sources that say that he had a sixth sense in everything that he did. He just had a sense for business and for what he did. Uh, and you could say that's true for anybody who, who goes, you know, extremely, exceptionally far in, in what they do. They just have an, a, some, a way of knowing, knowing what needs to happen and what elements to put into place. And A.E. Staley had a very, very keen sense of character. He could really read people very well. And he was very good at choosing the right people for a job or finding that someone was not going to be the right person for the job and making a change. So uh, he, he sensed right away and was able to, you know, analyze and, and, and talk to people that George Hallis would be a very, very good addition. Uh, the other thing A.E. Staley had going for him that everybody can learn from is he always listened to advice. Um, and he would go to all kinds of people for advice, not just, you know, lawyers and uh, heads of business, but he would talk to the common man because A.E. Staley was a common man. He grew up barefoot on a farm in North Carolina. He was born in a log cabin. And, you know, he knew the common, he was the common man. So he would talk to the common, you know, person, talk to everyday people all the time, at, at, even at the height of his career, would just spend time, you know, going downtown, just talking to people, talking to the, to, you know, the young salesmen that came into town and, and finding out, you know, how their business is, what they're doing, you know, are they doing something new and different? Uh, he was always learning from all kinds of people. So he would take advice from um, everyone that he could get it from. Uh, you have to also um, uh, take put into context that A.E. Staley only had about a third grade education because he worked on the farm. Um, he had formal schooling up until about the third grade, and then he was at home working, and his mother and grandmother uh, would uh, help him do, do some homeschooling. Um, but he basically had to learn a lot on his own, and he was determined to do that. And he, uh, we have a lot of interesting personal notes and and uh, just personal assets that show how he was always learning uh, to to be the best, learning how to. Uh, uh, you know, he wanted to be you know, good at, at reading and, and writing. And, uh, uh, you know, he wrote very eloquent business letters. We have so many of his personal uh, uh, possession of letters that he wrote for you know, business and for, for personal reasons. Uh, and uh, very, 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 became very eloquent for someone who only had a third grade education. Um, and we also look at uh, the, the math that he would do when he was on the road as a salesman and he would have all of his math written out. And it was it was exact. It was it was always accurate. And he only had a third grade education. He was extremely intelligent. Uh, so he but he still would listen to other people and listen to their advice. 
So he would talk to, to people around him. And I'm sure that he put a lot of thought into, uh, you know, bringing George Hallis on. And uh, he probably, you know, made uh, uh, um, the decision, uh, you know, didn't, didn't take it lightly, didn't take it lightly when, when he brought him on. But uh, uh, yeah, it sure, uh, it sure changed history. That's for sure. One decision that changed the history for so many people. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely changed the course. And like you said, he must have had a knack for talent and just that sixth sense of recruitment or mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. And speaking yeah. of, okay, let's pretend that the listener of the show right now doesn't know what we're saying and why, okay, we keep bringing up George Hallis and we keep bringing up Staley's. What's the connection there and why this is a football history podcast? Well, so so George Hallis uh, eventually became the you know the manager of the team. He was still playing and the manager of the team. He was playing on the baseball team as well, um, but started to take on the uh, the team in, in 1919. They were the Decatur Staley's and uh, they were in dust, an industrial league team and uh, uh, they were quite good and they were making headlines. There so we have a lot of newspaper headlines about their championships and about all the the, uh, the games that they won, and they were just uh, on fire. Um, and so 1920 comes along, and uh, again, uh, Hallis assembles uh, a team. Uh, it pretty, pretty much keeps it the same, uh, but leads this team uh, to you know to do better. They're they're selling more tickets, uh, you know, more they're attracting more people, and they start to have opportunities to play up in Chicago and are finding that um, they are really gaining a lot of uh, fans in Chicago. They can really sell tickets up in Chicago. I mean, of course, there's a, quite a bit more people as opposed to, you know, maybe selling a thousand and I'm just kind of making this up, uh, you know, maybe a thousand tickets in Decatur. They'll go up to Chicago and sell 6,000, 8,000 tickets. Uh, so that's a huge difference. And it, you know, makes a difference on every, every level. So they were starting to see that al already. And um, in uh, 1921, uh, they were, you know, again, uh, they, they were playing as Decatur Staley's. And a. E. Staley and George Hallis talked about bringing him up to Chicago and playing more games up there and decided that um, uh, maybe that would be a permanent place for them. And so A. E. Staley just said, okay, you take him up to Chicago and let's, let's, you know, see how it goes. And they, they did, they went up there. Uh, it was, it was fantastic. It was really, really a fantastic success. And A.E. Staley, again, had that sixth sense and knew that the, the future of football was not indicator. Uh, it was not, especially not at that time was not going to be indicator that this team, the future of this team needed to be in Chicago. Um, so eventually he had to make the decision and there were a lot of things that went into this, uh, to let that team go. And he gave George Hallis $5,000 and said, take that team up to Chicago, but I want you to keep the name for a year as the Decatur Staley's. So they played as the Decatur Staley's, um, in 1921. And then in 1922, their name changed to the Chicago Staley's and they kept that for a year and then they became the Chicago Bears. So um, it was something that A.E. Staley knew he had to let go of, um, you know, kind of like sending, I don't know, I, I, what a good analogy is, sending your kid off to college. You know, you, you have to eventually, you know there's something better for them. Keeping them here is not good for the team overall. The other side of that that is is that there were some some things going on with the company um, uh, with morale. Uh, apparently, the uh, uh, the the athletes were getting 
some favoritism and they were, they were stars. They were like celebrities. And so there was a little bit of, re, you know, resentment going on within this, this, this family of employees that, that these athletes were, you know, they were getting some, some, some time off and they, they didn't have to be at work the same amount of time. And then they were getting to go play these games and they were getting this star status. And uh, there were, there were becoming some issues with that. And that certainly is not what AE Staley wanted as part of his company. He has to put that first. He can't put sports. He wants to put sports first. He's a huge sports fan, uh, wants to put sports first, but um, he has to put the company first. Um, you know, you're talking a multi-million dollar company at this point, multi-million dollar in, in their dollars, uh, even more so to, in today's dollars. Uh, so he has a multi-million dollar company on his hands. He can't, he can't be sidelined with this little, you know, football team, you know, and, 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 and where it's going. And he, it was just the child he had to let, you know, move out of the house. And, um, uh, you know, it, you know, is it something that, you know, he ever regretted doing? Um, but probably, I, I can't say that there was a whole lot that he ever talked about after that. Um, again, football, football itself was not his passion. Baseball was his passion. And the interesting thing about that is even though that he ended uh, the company sponsored sports at the time that football went up to Chicago, uh, eventually they had uh, sports that um, were, were just kind of an, an, uh, an intramural uh, uh, that the company didn't pay for. They weren't semi-pro. And so he did have a baseball team later on and then, and basketball and, and bowling and, and, and all of those. And then, and like I mentioned, the, the women's teams, um, so they they still had sports later on, and he definitely enjoyed baseball, and uh, um, even uh, allowed the use of their field to the Three uh, I Baseball League, and uh, really still enjoyed baseball quite a bit. So I don't think I mean I know a lot of people are like, gosh, look what he gave away, but football itself was not his his passion he loved sports don't get me wrong and I, I'm sure he loved football and having the team but baseball was more of his passion if this had happened with a baseball team I think it would have been a much bigger bigger issue for him because he really really, really lo did love baseball and apparently from some historical records was quite a, a good baseball player in his own right uh, because it was such a, a, a you know a big guy and uh, probably was pretty powerful at, at playing but uh, uh, but he just had that business sense and knew that that's where there he was going to make money the fastest uh, the the one thing to go back to about his history was that uh, about the, what motivated him was his father died when he was 17 and that left him as the oldest of all of the children to um, provide for the family you know back then uh, he was born in 1865. So, uh, or, I'm sorry, 1867. So, uh, you know, back then in, in those, those days, uh, you were the oldest and you took care of your family. So, uh, he knew that he could be a businessman. He was certain he could be a businessman. Uh, he was certain that farming was not his thing. And uh, so, you know, going into sports or something like that was not really an option for him uh, because it would probably have been too risky for him uh, to not be able to provide for his family. So he knew right away that selling, that salesmanship was going to be the way he could provide for his family. And he continued to provide for for his family and for that farm uh, up until he died in 1940. He bought that farm uh, um, er, and paid for everything uh, uh, when his, his mother passed away and uh, he, he provided for that farm up until uh, the day he died and it always had the best of everything. So yeah, uh, football was not his, his number one passion. Uh, um, baseball definitely, definitely was. I mean, that, that's pretty common because back then football was still trying to find its way, especially as far as professional football goes. So um, business wise, of course, that was the right move to make at the time. Like you said, if employee morale is going down and all these other kinds of things, and he has this multi-million dollar business, which obviously was worth a lot more than <laughs> today's money. I mean, it's a no brainer. I just wonder if 
Like, have you ever been a part of a conversation where a family has kind of talked about that? Hey, what if this would have been sticking in our family? Oh, I mean, there's, there's always a, yeah, a what if um, uh, situation, but I, I, I think it might be a little just, it's far removed at this point. Uh, it's so far removed uh, from the generations that it doesn't, it doesn't even seem like a, con- a connection there uh, in, in, in some ways. Um, uh, yeah, if, if he would have held on that, it's, it's just, it's really very hard to even talk about because it would not have, have flourished in Decatur because they wouldn't have been able to have sell tickets like they could in a city like Chicago or even, you know, St. Louis, uh, you know, back then, or, or, uh, you know, Green Bay or, you know, somewhere, uh, Detroit. I mean, I mean, you had to be in a, in a much, much bigger city to uh, get those teams to grow like they did. And Decatur was just not the, not the place for it. It just was, was not a place for it. So it's, it's hard to really, uh, conceptualize that because it just really never would have taken off. Now, you can speculate all kinds of stories. I mean, yeah, could he have retained the ownership and had yeah, had Hallis take it to Chicago and and retain that over ownership? Um, certainly, that could have been uh, something that he did. But as as I mentioned, uh, there was the issue of morale in the company, um, and he was concerned about that because his employees came first. And he wanted happy employees because you're not going to have a productive and profitable company if you don't have happy employees. So you need to make sure that uh, you put the employees first and, and, and you want your employees to feel like your boss is putting you first. Uh, if, if you're giving your life to this company and you're coming in here and, uh, you know, busting your tail to do your best, you want your, your boss to appreciate that. So there was uh, that reciprocal uh, relationship. Uh, and, um, and he did appreciate, he loved his employees. They were, they truly, truly were like his, were, were his family. Um, so it, it, um, uh, it just, it just would have been difficult for, for him to, to keep that team in, 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 in Decatur um, and would have been even difficult for him to, to keep it, keep one in Chicago because it, it would have taken the, the, the spotlight off of everyone in, in Decatur and it would have cost a heck of a lot more money. And he had to, uh, you know, turn things around and, uh, you know, make sure because that, that football team was not, uh, was not cheap. Uh, it was costing him a lot of money to play football, and he could see that as well. It was not making money like like corn was at the time. They were not into soybeans yet, uh, so uh, but it was not making money like corn was. And uh, he actually, right as soon as the football team left, was when he got into soybeans, and that's when the company took off even more. And he knew that was coming. He knew that the soybean uh, 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 production was going to come. Um, and, and he had that sixth sense that it was going to be a big thing. And I, this is my personal feeling in, in, in researching this, um, that he probably part of, part of him, un, you know, kind of unloaded that so he could take on the soybean uh, uh, business, which of course is what made, made, you know, made his name for him really. Uh, and then took off like, you, like you wouldn't believe, and and he introduced the rest of the of the country, uh, even the you know rest of most of the world to soybeans. So uh, so yeah, so they're just they're just are it's not there are not simple answers. There it's just a very complex story. There's a lot a lot of uh, uh, a lot of tentacles to it. <laughs> yeah, and there's just a story all around. I mean, speaking of a story with the museum, we'll go back to that again. Are there any of the Decatur Staley? artifacts in the museum itself? Oh, absolutely. Um, we have a room full of, uh, uh, you know, ath- athletic uh, uh, memorabilia. Um, we, we definitely have uh, quite a bit of uh, artifacts all over about, you know, the company. Uh, of the, the, it's in, the, of course, the home that he grew up in. So we have a lot of, you know, personal things, uh, a lot of things about family members, uh, things in the community, uh, just really everything. Um, we've been very fortunate that the, the company that now owns the, the 
AE's daily manufacturing company is Tate and Lyle. And uh, uh, they have partnered uh, with us on some of the displays. Uh, we, we gave them some, some space there to put up uh, their own things. And uh, they have given us, you know, some items to uh, put in there. They have created a beautiful video uh, that shows the inside of the office building that AE Staley had built. So people can get a virtual tour of the office building when they come to the Staley Museum. Uh, so uh, so it's just been a, a really nice uh, partnership that we've been able to have with uh, to continue that with, with the company. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of a correlation here. I don't know if you can see, but um, the whole DeLorean thing, it's a Back to the Future reference. Uh-huh. And the clock tower in Back to the Future, I think it was November 12th in 1955, got struck by lightning. I saw July 1st or something like that at 2018, the house itself got struck by lightning. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Um, that was um, that was a little scary because uh, you know any I mean that can be a pretty devastating uh, situation. Um, we did get struck by lightning. There was a, just a, a summer storm that came through, uh, and we did have someone in the house when that happened, but no one was injured. Uh, we had pretty extensive damage, uh, and of course, it could have been a lot worse. And we were closed for several months to try to get everything. Uh, back to normal again. The house itself has four levels on it, and there was damage to all four levels. And uh, so we had quite a bit of extensive uh, work to be done uh, to get it, uh, you know, not only cosmetically uh, back in shape, but structurally. There was some structural damage inside that had to be taken care of. Um, and so there, there, that was a really tough situation uh, uh, to, to to be in. And uh, so we hope, yes, we hope that uh, that's something we can move past. And 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 by God's grace, we won't have that happen again. <laughs> right. And never, we don't ever want it to happen. And this is not an omen or anything. But if for whatever reason it would have been, this is it. If you were running out of the building, what's the one artifact you would have grabbed? Oh gosh. I know it's an impossible question, but <laughs> oh, because there's so much in there. Oh goodness, um, that's hard to because there are so many personal items of his personal personal items. Some of you know we don't even have room to put on display all of the things that um, uh, that he he had and, and that we have of, of his. Um, Goodness gracious. Um, I, I think the, the, the photographs, uh, maybe the photograph of, of him and his family. Um, that's the one thing that we can't replace as a fa- an old photograph would have been taken when he was maybe 10. So it would have been taken in around 1875, 76, 77, somewhere around there. Um, it is the only photograph that we have of the family and is the only photograph we have of him as a child. And so that yeah, probably would, would be uh, what we have. Luckily, we have a lot of it on uh, digital files. <laughs> you know, we learn and, and we're fortunate for that. But there definitely are some things that could not be replaced. Uh, oh, for sure. I mean, that's just anything that's that, that long ago, like you said, that's irreplaceable as far as that. And sure, you can digitize it. But of course, that's not the same as having it tangibly there. And when's the last time or have you ever had this experience where you were in the museum yourself and it just kind of hits you that how much history was in there? Oh, all, well, all the time. Um, it's, it's just, it's a little bit overwhelming because it's his home and you're in the space that he was in and they had the home renovated after they moved in and basically uh, had everything uh, redone to the way that they wanted. They had specifications for everything and had all these special things put in. And I think, I think possibly I have to go back and look at all my numbers and figures. I have so many numbers and figures uh, written down. I think in today's dollars, he ended up spending around $4 million for uh, purchase, he purchased the house and then did renovations. And I think in today's dollars, I, I did a, a computation on it. And I think it was around $4 million that it would have cost today. Uh, so, and, and, you know, in Decatur, that's, that's quite a bit, quite, definitely quite a bit. So, uh, uh, so he had, yeah, had this house 
kind of, I, I say built, but uh, designed and redesigned for, for he and his wife, Emma, and uh, uh, everything was just exactly the way that they wanted it. And so it's really, it's really neat to walk around there and walk where he walked and, uh, you know, be in the same space that, that, that he was with all of these artifacts that we have. As, as I mentioned, there are many, many things that we have that we haven't even been able to put on display. You know, we only have, a, you know, we're a nonprofit. We have only so many people, you know, to do the work. You know, if we had 100 people, we could get it all out there. Um, but, you know, we have little things like, like we have the original um, notebook that he kept in the 1800s in his pocket when he traveled. And we have, he would write down every sales transaction that he made on the road. So he would go to, you know, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and then go to uh, Oshkosh, and then he would go to Chicago, and then he would go to Decatur, and uh, go to Champaign, and he would write down where he sold, who he sold it to, what they bought, how much, how it was being shipped, uh, all of these things. And he, it was a ledger that he kept. And uh, uh, goodness gracious, um, I, I just, it's to hold that. And then what we found in there was it really, uh, it gave me goosebumps. He kept four leaf clovers in it and uh, had him pressed inside of the book. When we opened up the book and we found this book, he had four leaf clovers in it. So, um, so we don't have that on display uh, because it's, it's a difficult thing to display because you have to open up the book and, and it's, it's leather bound. And so, uh, you know, it's over 150 years old, so it's very difficult to, to open. So we have to find a way to, uh, to display that. Uh, but uh, it is really a remarkable uh, uh, artifact that we, we have of, of his uh, one of one of many neat little little things that we have. We have the family Bible that his grandmother had. Uh, and so it would have, you know, before he was, so, you know, probably the early 1800s, maybe mid 1800s that, uh, that, but there's no date in it, but we know for a fact that it was the family Bible that, uh, had been around, that was his grandmother had owned. And we have the paperwork, uh, that shows that she owned it. So, uh, so yeah, a lot of things we haven't been able to put on display yet, but we'll get there eventually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very cool. I mean, that Bible itself has just seen so much American history. And then for A. E. Staley himself, like you said, a $4 million home, but he started as a barefoot kid in North Carolina on a farm in a little tiny shack. And just, we, we started at the beginning of this thing with Augustus and the first emperor of Rome. Uh, let's go to the first emperor of the soybean world. <laughs> and I'm going to give you another one of those. So this is a, I can see a, a digital, I'm giving you the keys to my DeLorean here and you're going to get that baby up to 88 miles an hour, go back. You can ask A.E. Staley, you're going to have a dinner with him. You can ask him one question. What question are you going to ask him? Um, I, I think I, I, I definitely would ask him about the football team hands down. I think that's what most everybody in the family would ask him about. Um, <clears throat> what, what exactly were his thoughts at that time? Um, I, I think we've kind of narrowed it down. We've been able to do a lot of research on with a lot of documents that we have and talk to a lot of people. Um, and, and clearly, if, if you go into the you know company history and you go to look at the records from the company, you can see what was happening and you see that the you know, soybeans were uh, just about to, to make their debut. So he knew that this soybean thing was going to happen. I know he, 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 he had a sixth sense that it was going to be big, but he couldn't have even predicted how big it was going to be. Um, so yeah, he knew about the soybean thing when the whole football thing was kind of going in a difficult direction. Uh, but I still would like to hear a little bit more about, um, what he really thought about it because football was not his first love. It was baseball, you know, and maybe ask him, why didn't you put, you know, why didn't you maybe do more with your base with the baseball team? And since that was your, your real love. Um, I did, you know, as I mentioned, you know, that he, he, they did have uh, like three I league was playing on their field uh, after that in like the late twenties. Uh, and, you know, he did stay involved with, with, with baseball as a sport and, and was recognized uh, as, as someone that was a leader in a mover and shaker, uh, in the baseball world. Uh, so, um, uh, but, but yeah, I would like to hear a little bit more about, uh, 
about his thoughts. I think everybody would. I think I would be in good company with that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm a little biased too, though, because that's what this show is all about is the history of football. And I would like to know, like, you know, what's the reason why you did that? How how hard would it have been to give up one of your passions? And then, like you said, the flip side, if it was baseball, would you really have done that? Would you have given up the team and that kind of thing? And I'm going to give you the open floor right now, the discussion to talk about uh, whatever you want, the plans for the museum coming up or to let people know what it's all about. Uh, open floor. Let's go with the, Absolutely. the museum. Uh, I'm going to, uh, two things. Uh, uh, first, the museum, of course, we have the Staley Museum, which is in Decatur, Illinois, uh, at 361 North College was his address. And uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, home with four levels. Um, and, uh, we, it's been restored to as much of its original splendor as it can. And, uh, we have turned it into a museum and, and, uh, historic, it is a historic home and part of our, uh, historic homes in, in the city. So we have a, a lot of pride. The city has a lot of pride with it and a lot of the other beautiful homes in the area. Um, uh, we plan on, you know, expanding ex exhibits, uh, you know, doing more, uh, with it as soon as uh, COVID, uh, gets, gets, uh, past us. Uh, we were open for a while this past year, but we were in Illinois and uh, they've gone backward uh, a little bit with the, the spike in cases. So we're now closed uh, until further notice. But we have a website, staleymuseum.com, and you can go on there and check things out. We also have a Facebook page and an Instagram page and uh, you know, all that all that good stuff. So uh, um, so you can keep, keep keep up with us on social media and, and online. Um, and we probably will be having quite a bit more as we develop this documentary that I'm working on. Uh, we have a documentary that I have a film company called Spencer Films, and uh, you can go to uh, uh, spencerfilmsllc.com and uh, see the work that we're doing on the documentary about A.E. Staley. It's titled Fields of Gold. And um, we actually just uh, won a best of award at a, a film festival, a Los Angeles film festival, an online film festival. And you can see though their their previews of the um, uh, of the documentary. So there are football uh, history, uh, and you can see those on our uh, website. Um, we also are on uh, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, so you can uh, see us on, on there as well. Um, this documentary covers the life of A.E. Staley. So we talk about, you know, how he grew up uh, um, and goes all the way up in, until his death in 1940. And uh, it's it's just been a really, really fascinating journey to research this and to get to know him on this very, very personal level. Uh, and we don't know exactly the release date, but we're hoping it'll be probably the latter part of 21. Uh, we are in post-production right now. We do have a few things we have to finish filming because of COVID-related uh, uh, situations. Um, but we have been very fortunate that this past year we have been working all, the whole year uh, shooting uh, through the pandemic. Uh, we found ways to be COVID compliant. Uh, we traveled to the Football Hall of Fame. Uh, we have uh, interviewed uh, George McCaskey, was very uh, generous and uh, gave us an interview uh, when the Bears were in town for the 100th uh, year celebration last summer. They came to Decatur and we were able to interview uh, George in an, an exclusive setting. So uh, we were very uh, grateful for him to, to sit down with this. Uh, we will be going to the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame and talking to them, uh, we're looking at uh, talking, there's a lot more about the, uh, the baseball team uh, that uh, I can share uh, whenever you, if you want to talk about baseball sometime. Uh, so there's a huge story about, about all of that, um, uh, which George Hallis, of course, was involved in. Um, we went to North Carolina. We went to the farm that he grew up on. And shot video on the farm on that land. And I can't tell you what that was like. I mean, there are no words to describe what that was like. It was really incredible. The log cabin isn't there, but the land is. And um, 
Uh, it was was really incredible to meet people. Uh, we even met some some long lost relatives and and, and things like that. Uh, uh, it was just really really a wonderful trip to go out to North Carolina and actually be there uh, and be in 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 that space where he was and to really get a sense of of what his life was like. Uh, so we have, uh, have, have really been able to talk to so many people to make this a really rich story. Uh, we have here, uh, in town, I'm, I'm in Springfield right now, uh, the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum. We also have, uh, interviewed them for our story. There, uh, is, uh, some connection there that, uh, we talk about, uh, in our story. Uh, so, uh, we've also talked about, uh, talked to the, uh, Smithsonian affiliate, in North Carolina at the North Carolina Museum of Natural History. Uh, so we have really been able to incorporate a lot of, of, of people with that, that have learned some really, really rich history and to give us some really great background uh, about what his life was like and what times were like that he was working in with the way he, that he grew up, you know, what times were like, you know, when, when the company was running, when the sports teams were going, what was going through his mind? What was he thinking? And um, try, to, try to get inside of his head, so to speak. Uh, so it's been a really, really uh, wonderful journey to uh, to to uh, work on this. And I actually will be kind of uh, there's a part of me that will miss it when uh, when I lift it off and, and we have our uh, our premiere. Again, we don't know. We're working on distribution options. There are so many options now with streaming services and digital content. Um, uh, we're finding, however, that sometimes, you know, selling to a distributor means you're also giving away creative content. And we are not willing to do that. So we're working to make sure that we keep control of, of the story and uh, keep control of, of all of uh, uh, what, what the elements that go into it. So, uh, so we're going to find a way uh, that works for everybody to honor this story and so that everyone can uh, see it as soon as possible. We're so excited to share this with everyone because we have been working on this uh, project for about almost two years now. So uh, we're, we're ready to show it off. <laughs> there you go. A little bit different type of episode again for the Football History Dude. But I do think that it is an important story for us to be able to understand the true origin of the person that helped form and create what is now known as the Chicago Bears. One of the most storied franchises in the league. But I also think that it's kind of cool to hear about, I don't know, the dreams and the visions that people have. And then they just go after it. Like the quote that we brought up. Big men don't do small things. Speaking of that, we're planning on doing some big things here at the Sports History Network. And we want you, you know, just like the whole, I want you, the old American dude, the Uncle Sam, to be part of this in some way. Head over to the contact page if you're interested over on the website, which again is sportshistorynetwork.com. Whether you want to dip your toes into the shallow end by writing maybe an article about your favorite sports history topic, a team, a player, a sports league, whatever it is. Or you want to go full on belly smack off the high rope into the deep end and be crazy like Darren Hayes over there pumping out a daily football history podcast. We're here to help you. Our mission is to become the headquarters for sports yesteryear, and we want you to be a part of it. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, Please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to the footballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. 
To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today. Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.